Ladies and gentlemen, we want to welcome you to a very interesting historical event. And Phil Gardner, who is actually in charge of this, is taking a little profile for some reason. So he's asked us to begin now, and I would like to introduce the governor. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming. What an exciting morning, exciting day here in New Hampshire. It's really wonderful that we're gathered to really celebrate and learn more about uh, former Governor John Wynant, uh, affectionately known to his friends as Gil. Um, we're particularly honored that Governor Wynant's son, Rivington, and his wife, Joan, could be with us today. We should give them a round of applause. <laughs> Many people in New Hampshire really don't know of the amazing contributions that John Wine had made to the United States and to Great Britain, and really what an integral role he played in the Allied victory in World War II. Um, it's really, truly amazing, and I appreciate all the terrific work that Lynn Olson has done to bring his story to life. Many of you here today um, helped provide some of the research for Lynn's work. Um, and uh, really appreciate um, you doing that for Lynn. Um, that group includes Fred Upton, uh, Lucy Larry, Mary Louise Hancock, Dean Dexter, Steve Winship, Stuart Lamprey, and Bert Whittemore. So I want to thank you all for sharing your memories with Lynn Olson as she compiled her research for the book. I also want to thank uh, two former great governors who are with us here today. Uh, former Governor Walter Peterson and former Governor Steve Merrill. Let's give them a round. We also have um, some sons of former governors. Peter Thompson is here. Peter, welcome. Um, we have the spouse of a former governor, Bill Shaheen. <laughs> Executive Council, Ray Burton, John Shea, um, Deborah Pignatelli, um, Beth Hollingworth, is Beth here? Beth's not here. Um, Senator Larson, President of the State Senate. Um, I don't think Terry Norelli's here. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, the work that Mike Pry did. I, I, as I was mentioning to Mike, and I called him after the articles he wrote for the Monitor, you know, generally as governor, I have a pile of reading that I have to get through every day, and I generally flip through the papers, but when I came across my stories, um, I just thought they were riveting, and they certainly caught my attention, and I devoured them with, with tremendous amount of interest and eager, so Mike, thank you for what you did. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank Stan Cloud for joining us today and for all the work that Stan did. And finally, I want to thank somebody who doesn't like to be thanked, who generally does all the work and then sits in the background, and that's our great Secretary of State, Bill Gardner. Thank you, Bill. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Lynn Olson. Lynn is really a remark. Oh, you know, I need to thank, I need to welcome you know, one of my favorite people in the state, former executive counselor Ruth Griffin, is here today. Thank you. Mr. Lamprey, Charlie Bass. Um, uh, you know, let me, I don't want to go around and introduce everybody, <laughs> but thank you all for being here. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Lynn Olson. Um, Lynn is really a remarkable author who has written extensively about American history, and I know we all look forward to what Lynn has to say about former Governor John Wynan. Thank you, Governor Lynch, and, and thank you all for, for coming today. I am just, um, honor is, is just a tiny, tiny word to, to tell you how I feel uh, about this uh, event and about all of you distinguished guests who are here today. Uh, I'm going to take just a couple of seconds um, to thank some people too, very, very quickly. Uh, most of them uh, the governor has already mentioned. Uh, but above, above and beyond Bill Gardner, 
uh, who, uh, when I called him to, to ask if I could talk to him about Gil Wynant, uh, I could not imagine how incredibly gracious and hospitable and uh, welcoming and every other adjective I can think of that he was when I came here. Uh, it was in the, the beginning of the 2008 presidential campaign, fall campaign, that I came here. And he dropped everything for one whole day and, um, and introduced me to many of you who are in this room who gave me incredible information about Bill Wynant. He and Dean Dexter and I drove around Concord and went to various places that, um, that Wynant, uh, where he lived, where he went to school at St. Paul's. And, uh, you know, everybody does acknowledgments, all authors do acknowledgments, and sometimes you don't really mean, you mean it, but you know, it's, it's, it's pro, pro forma, you have to do it. In my case, my acknowledgments to Bill Gardner were not pro forma. Uh, he played such a key role in this book, and I really appreciate it. Very quickly, let me uh, also thank Dean, who was terrific, uh, Bert Whittemore, um, Phyllis Bennett, who has, has worked with Bill in organizing this event and everything else that is occurring in New Hampshire during my stay. She and her husband Ray are longtime friends of Stan's and mine, and uh, you have just been wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Mike Pride for those fantastic articles. Um, and uh, above all, uh, Ruben Tumayan. Um, uh, John Gilbert Wynant's son, who has been, he and his wife Joan have been um, so wonderful and so gracious in talking to me about um, the governor. So, uh, as I said, I am really delighted to be here today to honor one of the greatest governors of New Hampshire, uh, John Gilbert Wynant. To be honest, I didn't know anything about Gil Wynant uh, until a few years ago when I was doing research for another book project. <coughs> and I was astonished to discover what I learned about this man. Uh, the most significant discovery for me was the key role he played in creating the wartime alliance between the United States and Great Britain, and then keeping it alive once it was born. And one of the main reasons I wrote Citizens of London was to bring him to greater public attention and to give him the credit he so richly deserves. The Anglo-American Alliance during World War II has come to be known as the special relationship that helped win the war, preserve democracy, and save the world. As the years have passed, its creation has seemed almost <coughs> preordained. First, Winston Churchill and the British people of standing alone against Hitler until Franklin Roosevelt and the Americans came riding to their rescue. In fact, it was far from certain until Pearl Harbor that the alliance was actually going to happen. And once it did, it was a fragile, intention-filled partnership from the moment of its birth. Creating it and then keeping it alive was not an easy task, to put it mildly. In Citizens of London, I take a behind-the-scenes look at the Alliance, told from the perspective of three key Americans who played vital roles in creating it and then helping to keep it alive. Now, two of the three are very well known, or are known by many Americans. Um, the first is Edward R. Murrow, the legendary CBS newsman who became a household name in the United States. Uh, as a result of his reporting from the rooftops of London during the Blitz and the Battle of Britain. The second is Avril Harriman, who back then was an ambitious, hard-driving, multimillionaire businessman who was sent to London in March 1941 to oversee Lend-Lease Aid to Britain. And the third man was John Gilbert Wynan, a man who was, has been almost totally forgotten in his own country, but in many ways was the most significant of the three. As you all know, he was the U.S. ambassador to Britain from 1941 to 1946, replacing Joseph Kennedy, who went back to the United States in 41, uh, 1940, late 1940, declaring England is gone and I'm for appeasement 100%. Actually, 1,000%. He was even stronger than that. So Joe Kennedy was not exactly a hard act to follow. 
But Gil Wynant was the absolute opposite of Joe Kennedy. A shy, unassuming man, he had grown up on Manhattan's east side and first came to New Hampshire as a student at St. Paul's here in Concord. He fell in love with the school and the state and once told a reporter that the hills overlooking St. Paul's came to mean more to him than any other place on earth. He felt at home here. He cared so deeply about the school that after attending Princeton, he came back to teach history there. His students worshipped him. Um, many years later, uh, one of his students, T.S. Matthews, Tom Matthews, who became the managing editor of Time magazine, said that he was the most inspiring uh, teacher he had ever had in his whole life. When World War I broke out, Wynette became a pilot in the new U.S. Aviation Corps, flying in combat in France. When it was over, he returned to New Hampshire and resumed his fledgling career in politics. He had been elected to the New, new, uh, new Hampshire House of Representatives before he had gone over in World War I, and when he came back in 1920, he was elected to the State Senate. In 1924, he ran for governor. Very few people at that time thought he had a chance. He was a liberal, an intellectual, a former New Yorker, and a terrible speaker to boot. <laughs> <laughs> but he surprised everyone, first defeating his Republican primary opponent, and then the incumbent Democrat. He was elected to three terms in all. A man well ahead of his time, showing a passion for economic justice and social change that equaled or better that of FDR, who was then governor of New, of New York. When I was here um, in, in uh, Concord doing my research, uh, I was talking to Dean, and he compared him to the idealistic characters that Jimmy Stewart played in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and other movies. And I think that comparison is quite apt. He was a strong supporter of FDR and the New Deal, despite being a Republican. And in fact, he sacrificed his political career in 1936 because of that support. Uh, Roosevelt had named him head, the first head of the Social Security Board. Uh, the Social Security Act had just passed in 1935. Um, the most revolutionary uh, piece of legislation, piece of social legislation that really has ever been enacted. Uh, the Republicans were out to kill it. They didn't want it. And in the 1936 presidential campaign, Alf Landon campaigned against Social Security. Uh, and in fact, the Republicans conducted a smear campaign against the program. Wynant was so incensed by this um, that he resigned as head of Social Security um, and went out basically campaigning for the act and announced his support publicly for Franklin D. Roosevelt's reelection. That basically killed his political, it did kill his political career as a Republican. Uh, the Republicans would have nothing to do with him. From that moment on, he was Roosevelt's man uh, for the, and was for the rest of his life. Uh, Roosevelt later appointed him to the International Labor Organization in Geneva. Uh, he eventually became director of that organization. Uh, and as the world lurched to war in the late 1930s, Gil Wynant uh, acted as Roosevelt's eyes and ears, one of Roosevelt's, uh, the people that Roosevelt counted on. He would travel all over Europe and report back to Roosevelt um, unofficially uh, what he was seeing in terms of Germany, et cetera. In 1941, he was appointed by FDR to be ambassador to Britain. One of the most difficult jobs um, that the administration had, because remember, who his predecessor was, Joe Kennedy, who really had poisoned the relationship between the two countries, not only by his appeasement policies, uh, but by his active dislike of Churchill. Um, the British people, quite frankly, couldn't stand him when he left. And so, and so there was a lot of repair work to be done when Wynant came, and he did it brilliantly. After the war, the Times of London would call Wynant the adhesive, the glue, that helped hold the wartime partnership together. There are so many things that are compelling about this man during this time, but what stands out for me was the extraordinary relationship he had with the British people. 
From the day he arrived in Britain in March 41, which was the worst time of the war for the British, they were close to being defeated at that point. They were hanging on by the skin of their teeth. From the day he arrived, he made very clear that unlike his predecessor, he was there to stay. The first words he spoke after stepping off his plane were, there is no place I'd rather be at this time than in England. During the heaviest raids of the Blitz, he would walk the streets of London while the bombs were still falling and ask everyone he met what he could do to help. That had always been his goal in life was to provide whatever help he could give. When coal miners walked out, British coal miners walked out um, on strike in 1942, I mean, it couldn't have happened at a worse time. Coal was the lifeblood of British industry, uh, and the war was not going all that well at that point. Um, when they walked out, the, gov the British government tried to get them to go back. They refused to do it. So the British government called on the American ambassador Bill Minot to help settle the coal strike. Uh, can you imagine? I mean, it's just, it's, it's a revolutionary idea. He agreed to do so, and he went up to Durham um, in, in the north of England and gave one of the most powerful speeches I think I have ever read uh, about the importance of these miners to the war effort, but also he, he unveiled his vision of what the world was going to be like after the war. Um, it, you know, it wasn't just going to be victory, it was going to be a better world for everyone. And I can't do it justice, I would have to, to read the speech, or you would have to read the speech to get the full um, brilliance of that speech. But it was, it was so effective um, that after the speech, um, after the miners gave him a standing ovation, they voted to go back to work. He did, in fact, help them strike. The British people loved him. Um, for many of them, his warmth, his kindness, and his compassion, his determination to stand with them and share their dangers was the first tangible sign that Americans did indeed care about what happened to them in their country. He showed them the best side of America. When he left London after the war, the outpouring of love and gratitude was nothing short of astonishing. Not surprisingly, Winston Churchill probably summed up those feelings best. At a farewell dinner, the former prime minister, with great emotion, said this, there was no one who ever had a more momentous mission than Mr. Wynan. There was no one who came closer to the heart of Britain. There was no one who, while upholding in the strictest manner the interests and rights of his own country, made us feel he was a true, faithful, and unyielding friend. He is a friend of Britain. He is more. He is a friend of justice, freedom, and truth. He has been an inspiration. Churchill was absolutely right. John Gilbert Wynant was and continues to be an inspiration in so many ways. An inspiration in how he represented the best side of America to England. An inspiration in how he pressed so hard for social justice and the creation of a better life for working men and women throughout the globe an inspiration in his determination to persuade the nations of the, world, the, of the world, in his words, to concentrate on the things that unite humanity rather than on the things th that divide it. The last thing that struck me about Gil Wynant was his great love of New Hampshire. This was the place, he once told a reporter, where he felt most at home. After spending a little bit of time here, I can understand why. The man and the state were made for each other. As I said, I was really blown away when I first came to Concord to do research on Wynan. The kindness, the generosity, the hospitality, the sheer neighborliness of this state and the people I met um, was just amazing. I learned a lot about Wynan from all of you, but I also learned a lot about the qualities that make New Hampshire and its people very special indeed. And I thank you all very much for that.
she's uh, willing to take a few about uh, her research and uh, the things she's discovered about coming on in. I have kind of an interesting question. As I understand, he was very close to um, Eleanor Roosevelt, and in fact, closer perhaps to him than even the president. Would you like to remark about how that worked? I don't know if he was closer to uh, Eleanor than to Franklin Roosevelt. He was very close to Franklin Roosevelt. Um, I, I think they, um, they, were, they were friends, uh, not just uh, political acquaintances. And my pride under, uncovered a fantastic anecdote that really hasn't been reported that, that, um, that, that Roosevelt actually was seriously considering Wynant uh, as vice presidential nominee in 1944. I mean, that's been reported, but um, that people kind of blacked it off. But in fact, he, he actually, he, Wynant was at the top of his list, and, and basically he was argued out of that. Uh, but but Wynant was a very, very close friend of Eleanor Roosevelt's, who, who considered him to be, uh, in, in a way, one of her best friends. Uh, Wynant had an ability to make people confide in him. And, um, and he did that with a lot of people. And Eleanor Roosevelt was one of them. Uh, she said uh, a couple of times how much she, how much she relied on him uh, in, at various times in her life. Um, so th there was a, a very, very close uh, tie between the two of them. I was asking uh, Lynn about her appearances around the country, and I was thinking that perhaps the mo most interest in this book from the national press is regarding Edward R. Murrow and maybe Harriman, who are quite famous, but that's the opposite. Is that correct? No, everybody wants to know about Wynant. Um, <laughs> uh, I was on The Daily Show last night with John Stewart, and, and he, the person he wanted to talk about the most was Wynant. Uh, I was uh, interviewed by Robert Siegel on All Things Considered, and he told me going in, he said, I know about Murrow, I know about Harriman, uh, I know absolutely very, well, he, no, he said he had never really heard of Johnny Robert Wynant, and he said, that's all I want to talk about, and that's, that's in fact what happened. Mike, if you'd like to expand on your research, that's very fascinating. <laughs> you get a footnote of history. Yes. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I just wanted to ask, um, you know, this is a man who was a terrible speaker, a terrible administrator, incredibly disorganized, <laughs> flaming <laughs> idealist. Uh, how was he successful as an administrator and, and in this role? How, how, how with all those handicaps, uh, was he successful? Um, he was all that. He was, he was one of the worst administrators, apparently, that anybody had ever encountered. Um, in, in, in London, he was, he was kind of absent-minded, and he would get so involved in his thought process that he, he would pace back and forth, apparently, a lot. And he would order whoever was in the room to take a letter. Um, and one time it was his number two guy in the embassy, the, not the charge, but the minister counselor, I guess, who, who, was, who did it, but was kind of offended that you know he would be put in the position of the secretary to take the letter. But he said he walked in a couple days later, and there was um, uh, Admiral Stark, who was the head of the naval forces in Europe, frantically. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it was his, his personality that that empathy, that great love of people that he had, um, that sense that he was really interested, truly interested in everybody he met, and that it was not just a facade. The man really cared deeply about people. And I think that just, you know, overcame all of his, his uh, deficiencies in terms of a, a speaker. I mean, the New York Times once wrote about him, you know, people listening to him give a speech, the first um, sit there feeling sorry for him and end by giving him a standing ovation. I mean, I can't explain it. I mean, I think you'd have to be there to, to know, but he had such a great force of personality and, and such a great warmth and caring for people. Um, one woman in London said, when John Gilbert Wynne walks in the room, everyone suddenly feels better, which I think is a great description of him. How he did it, I don't know, but he did. Just been informed by your staff governor that you have an appointment. <laughs> you want to hold off? I'm fine. <laughs> Just so I don't get in trouble. <laughs> 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 don't get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Very Louise Hancock. Senator? Um, I wonder if you would comment a little bit about his relationship and the regard Francis Perkins had for him. <clears throat> 
Um, yes, Francis Perkins, the uh, FDR Secretary of Labor, uh, and he were very, very close, very close allies. And she, in fact, was um, pushed him, I think, for all his jobs, um, for head of Social Security, uh, for, for the, going to ILO, and for uh, being ambassador to Great Britain. Uh, both she and Felix Frankfurter, and, and there were others, um, very much pressed Roosevelt to name him as ambassador. Roosevelt was inclined to do that anyway because he wanted somebody who um, knew and worked well with the Labor Party in England, uh, labor leaders, because Roosevelt was convinced that the labor, that the labor Party was going to come to power either during the war or shortly after the war, which is in fact what happened. So he wanted somebody who, who really could work with them and knew them. Um, and why, why not certainly you know, filled that bill. Why not? Obviously, also became very close to Winston Churchill. Um, but he, but, um, but to go back to your point, uh, Frances Perkins was very, very important in Gil Wynette's life and career. She actually sent him vitamin pills during the war because she, she, she thought that he was uh, not keeping his health up, and she was trying to do everything she could to keep him there. You know, throughout the war. Interestingly, since the book came out. Uh, somebody from the Francis Perkins Foundation, which is based in Maine, is really interested in this book and, uh, and, uh, and very enthused about that relationship. Uh, it's interesting uh, that you bring up in your book his humanity, his concern for the common man. It's interesting in this room, for instance, this is on the State House, uh, the governor's office was actually that room there. And uh, this room was kind of a meeting place for people who wanted to come in and see the governor. And virtually anybody get in and see Governor Wyman. There are other governors, kind of difficult. The story that Andy Anderson used to say was when Sherman Adams was governor, you had an appointment, he would stare at you as you walked all the way up <laughs> to meet him. But with Wyman, that was quite different. What, was, what did you see in your study with Wyman? Uh, here's a man who was governor three times, first time three times governor, New Hampshire, state senator, who had such uh, a persona that it was not the typical hard-driving person like say, April Herman. How, how did that work with him? In your book, you certainly comment about how Herman tried to usurp his authority. Uh, how do you attribute his success with his kind of gentle spirit? Well, again, I think that the compassion and that feeling for his fellow man, for, for people, came through over and over and over again. And that's what endeared him to the people of New Hampshire. Um, you know, um, Bill Gardner was telling me all these stories when I came here about how he would, and, and they're in the book, how he would hand out the money in his pocket, the coins in his pocket, to homeless men, um, or unemployed, the unemployed who were sunning themselves against the, the, you know, against the grant walls of the Capitol. Um, and, and that deep commitment to helping others, I mean, it was not, it was absolutely through and through this man. And it, it really came out, that's what endeared him to the British people. I mean, can you, I find this very hard to believe. When I first went over to England yeah, about this, people said that everybody knew him in England. And I thought, oh, come on. You know, the American ambassador, you know, people, but people, everybody did know Gil Wynant in England during the war. He made that big of an impression. Uh, and it was just, it was just Gil Wynant. It was just who he is, a, an incredibly special man um, that uh, God knows it would be fantastic if we had more people like him. Speaking of that, we have several people in the room today who, as children, uh, had encounters with, uh, with Governor Wynett when he was a uh, chief executive of New Hampshire. I'm going to ask uh, a couple of them to maybe give a reminiscence. I, I know this one gentleman, uh, former Congressman Perkins Bass, who, as I understand, was very close to the family, and you even dated Rivington's sister, I understand. I dated Connie. <laughs> I remember very well. <laughs> Connie.
the Mass family goes back in New Hampshire. In fact, I think Teddy Roosevelt's daughter came to uh, Winant's funeral, and part of that was the relationship that Winant had, your, your family, your dad had, and uh, even Stiles Bridges had with that Bull Moose campaign, the progressive movement in the early part of the century. So there's certainly history in this room. We have another gentleman who uh, remembers an, a youthful encounter with Governor Winant, Fred Upton, prominent uh, New Hampshire and Congress attorney. Thank you. In 1928, I was all of 10 years old. Um, on a Sunday, my father took me uh, to Sunday school at St. Paul Church here on Park Street. And after Sunday school, I went down the, the street uh, to my father's office. It was in the Papier building, uh, the corner office on the second floor. Governor Wyant was then out of office, but he had a private office in the Papier building right next to my father's office. While not finding my father in his office, I wandered into uh, uh, Governor Wyant's office. And there I met the governor, very, very friendly. He picked me up and rocked me on his knee. <laughs> close to Governor Wine, and he would tell the story about how he was uh, he was a plant superintendent at Keene Normal School then, and Governor Wine would come down and sit with his dad in the boiler room and smoke his pipe and rock his chair. And uh, Charlie Beard, when he was in, he did make it to London, he said he visited Wine at the embassy, and when he walked down the stairs, he just looked just like Abraham Lincoln. And he did have a real interest in Lincoln. In fact, if Billy Gardner advises, that the portrait of Lincoln in the Representatives Hall was placed there because of uh, Wyant's request. Now, Ray Solari, a conquered young boy, had an encounter with somebody on the streets of the city. Could you share a little bit about that, Ray? Well, back in around 1930, in those days, living in a blue collar district, and coming up from Blue Collar Parents. Uh, the word around the neighborhood was that if you needed athletic equipment, walk out to St. Paul School. Those kids out there, they have so much that they leave it around. <laughs> <laughs> and so we decided one Sunday that we would walk out to St. Paul School. I lived up around near Walker Street, which is about, I would say, six or seven miles away from St. Paul's. And so this afternoon, we walked up there, Red Murphy and I, were close friends, and we were going up there to really make a haul. <laughs> As it turned out, there wasn't too much to pick up. <laughs> and uh, so we were on the way home, and I would say it was around 5, 5.30. It was beginning, it was in the fall, and it was beginning to get dark. And we were tired, and we had just about left the St. Paul School grounds when this Ford coupe
how we were situated in school, and our thoughts about various things, and carried the conversation, and it was, it was so great. So, that evening, he left us off where we wanted to get out, and just said goodbye, didn't tell us who he was or anything. And that evening, uh, Red and myself, we decided that we would go to the Capitol Theater. It had just opened uh, recently, and we were really anxious to see what it was like inside. And we sort of figured that we wouldn't be seeing movies there for a while, yet things financially were kind of tight in those days. And uh, so this Sunday there was a performance being put on, or uh, maybe not a performance, but a memorial uh, that was, so it was right around Amistice Day, I think it was. And, uh, we decided that we would go, and it was crowded. So we had to sit right in the front row in the theater. And I think the memorial was being conducted by the American Legion. And the principal, uh, the man in charge, I would say, of introducing the different speakers. And we listened to quite a few, you know, being kids, you know, uh, thought straight and so forth. <laughs> and then finally, he announced and introduced the ex-governor Wyman. And we looked, you know, <laughs> and we hoping that <laughs> that's the guy who picked us up. <laughs> and needless to say, our attention focused on what he had to say. <laughs>
And uh, uh, he actually didn't actually scoop me up. It was a rather complicated day uh, because uh, it was a day I shan't forget, obviously. But my tutor, who was a wonderful man, and had been Montgomery G2 at the age of 29, at the age of 20. So he looked after me, he got me into a car, where I go to another person's house, the former head of the International Labor Organization. And then from there I went up to Eden. And he couldn't have been kinder, as far as I, no matter how he tried. And after my father died, I kept going down there or at his house in Chesterfield Street. And uh, I, I got very, very fond of him. Uh, he, we had breakfast so we went together, just wonderful. To him. I, and I've always had greatest respect for him. Uh, there a series of chairs in, at uh, Hyde Park, the Roosevelt Library. And uh, they were going to get them, by the way, like, for the, um, uh, the building of the, of the new center. And uh, I put one of them in this book, that's like, for one reason. I, I actually named one for Morrow, one for Eden, one for Stella Reddy, one for my father, and one for a congressman. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. One, one uh, prominent family in New Hampshire had a very important relationship with White and that's the Whittemore family. In fact, uh, Lawrence Whittemore, industrialist, president of the Boston uh, Federal Reserve Bank, was one of the bearers of the funeral of Governor Wynan, and his son Bert is here. I believe your family bought the Patriot Building from Wynan, is that correct? Yeah. But anyway, you went to England and did some research similar to uh, Liz, and what's your comment about that? Yeah. I guess, uh, let's, I'll oh, yeah, screw it up here. Uh, fast forward 30 years, I was an amateur historian and decided I would do something to commemorate Wynan's life in England because it gave me a chance to take my family to England for the summer. <laughs> and uh, I found the most gracious people. There's no city in the world that has more obscure libraries than London. And uh, one of the most interesting ones is the newspaper library, which is at the very end of the trolley line, as I think in a place called Collindale. When I got up there, I had my credentials. This Nice old guy says, oh, it's so nice to have you Yanks Brown here. It's very exciting in the summer. Oh, my God, you could hear a relief drop, you know. <laughs> but he said, we only have 28 major languages. This is a small collection, most of the colonial ones. And of course, I was absorbing that, uh, you know, you're a colonial and we're the old guys. And so uh, he said, what do you want? And he had to fill out a slip. I found a liquor in New Hampshire. <laughs> and um, so I put January to March 41, and he disappeared. And he came back and said, excuse me, is that 1741? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, there, that's an example of how that's British humor. <laughs> and another thing, I found a very obscure uh, photograph collection called the Mantell, if, I, if memory serves, the Mantell, something like that. They had hundreds of glass negatives, 11 by 14 or something, eight by the huge things, and they have saved them from the beginning of photography. And so I, I showed up there, and this woman was very gracious, and she took me around, and she said, oh, yes, why not? He was that American chap. Uh, no, and I said, yes, he was. And uh, so we disappeared, and he, she started showing me these negatives. Well, like most human beings, negatives are not terribly good for me. I couldn't tell what we had. And as uh, we were stumbling around, someone came in, and they said, uh, uh, Mr. Jones, are you available? And she said, no, I've got me a yank. <laughs> At any rate, uh, I said, gee, I don't need to bother you. You know, obviously things are really ripping around here. And uh, uh, she said, 
Don't be silly, young man. We've kept these things for 30 years and nobody's looked at them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's a couple of stories about that. Great, I urge you to do it. We maybe ought to have a wine at, uh, a redone uh, because uh, stories abound in that city, don't they? Yes. Forever. Thank you, Bert. Time to bring this uh, little festive event to, to the close. Uh, does anybody have a question for Lynn? This is a good time to ask her a question. She'll also be tonight at uh, the Historical Society over here on uh, Park Street and at 7 o'clock, I believe. I think she'll be speaking at St. Paul's tomorrow. We certainly appreciate uh, everything she's She's given a gift not only to the people of New Hampshire, but to history, certainly. And uh, as Mike Pride said, and a lot of them, it's the same. Maybe this is. This is the time that uh, Gilbert Weinman is getting his due finally in history. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please enjoy some refreshments and, and uh, make over.